Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and I am so pleased to introduce you to our guest this morning, Doug Newton, author of the Fresh Eyes series, Discovering New Insights in Familiar Passages. Doug is the co-founder and director of the National Prayer Ministry of the Free Methodist Church USA, the author of nine books. He served for 30 years as a senior pastor and for 15 years as editor of Light and Life magazine. Uh, Doug and his wife, Margie, live in Greenville, Illinois. Doug, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here talking with you. Uh, Doug, you devoted a lifetime to service in the kingdom, kingdom work, and uh, one of the things you'll find out about our program is that we're just committed to biblical truth. And the biblical truth is, is what's contained in the, the confines of the written text of the Bible. Uh, me coming out of the Jewish world, we fully embraced the sages and the teachings because we looked at God as telling us what to do, but he never gave us those eight or ten paragraphs of the instruction manual of the how to do. Mm. Uh, you know, write my laws on the doorposts of your house. Well, do I do that with a Sharpie? Do I do that with a chisel? Do I do that with a uh, screen print? Uh, am I supposed to paint it? Uh, it, it? Am I to do it in Hebrew or am I to do it in English? Which, which doorposts? All my doorposts? The ones to my bedroom? The one to my bathroom? No, nope, not the bathroom. Uh, the front door. And so we don't get those instructions. So we need uh, a certain set of fresh eyes on these instructions given us by, by God. And I, I look as a Jewish believer at the New Testament as giving me the how-tos of the what to's that I'd already been told because mm -hmm. there's no new, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, the New Testament really does give us, and, and Paul especially, Jesus of course and the Beatitudes and, and that set of instructions, but um, you weren't always a pastor and you weren't always an editor and you weren't always a husband and a father. There was a point in your life when your faith had to become your own. What was that journey like in the early years? Well, I grew up in a Christian family, but as many people's story goes, it did take, you know, going through a lot of different experiences, particularly in my teenage years and then on into college, before I began to even understand what it meant to try to make, you know, your faith your own. And I think it wasn't really until I, uh, I kind of took a back door into pastoral ministry. I wasn't planning to go there. I was planning to go into philosophy and, and study um, to teach at the university level. And a, an, a, a, an opportunity, or really it was more of a, a need to find a job, uh, opened up for me to fill pulpit at a church that I thought was going to be a, just kind of a part-time, short-term student pastorate turned out to be 13 years, and that was the beginning of my uh, my pastoral call, which took kind of a long time to come into focus. But it was, it was really in the context of trying to minister to people, trying to speak what God might want to say into the lives of a congregation, that I found myself in desperate need for continual insight into Scripture that becomes became my own as I'm discovering but I found that so many times the way we grow and our faith grows and our confidence in the Lord grows and our understanding and our wisdom grows is when we're on the front lines having to find out what it is that we need to say or do in order to actually serve somebody in the way that the Lord would serve I I just see that model really in the way Jesus related to the disciples that was on the job training it was, uh, now you go do these things, and it was in the process of doing that that the Holy Spirit worked through them, and they discovered uh, how the person of Jesus became a living reality in their life, even after the resurrection and the ascension and so forth. And so that's my story, really. It was in the context of doing ministry that the, my faith in the Lord and the power of His Word and the reality, the truth of His Word and the reality of His presence, all of that stuff began to, to coalesce uh, around the actual uh, enterprise of doing ministry. So you literally got thrown into it? Yes. Uh, by divine intervention, 
and wound up finding that you had to have your own faith. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I was in the pulpit, one of the things I would describe is that the office of the prophet uh, is the office of the pastor in yeah. regards to the congregation. He is the congregational prophet, and God is to speak to him and through him as if it was the consultation with a great physician. Mm -hmm. And we were to write a prescription uh, given to us by the Lord based on the diagnosis of the human condition of the community we serve. That's right. And you could have two congregations next door to each other and both bodies be uh, afflicted with a different malady and therefore the message would be different because the Holy Spirit, although the same Holy Spirit, uh, provides for each one of us what is needed to convey to feed the flock the diet they need, the boundless nutrition they need, and the prescription they need. Yes. And uh, it's, it's really quite extraordinary how that works. And when you come to that realization that that we are called to have this very personal, very intimate, very transparent relationship with the Holy Spirit through Jesus to the Father and embrace right. the Word of God as being, well, how do I? And this is what you and I talked about offline is that I came out of the Jewish world where we got all the what to do's, but we required the rabbis to write for us the how to do's and there was as many op opinions as to how to do it as there were uh, opinions. It was just, it was, you know, I actually call them the commentators. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, a commentator is just an ordinary potato. Why would I take my theology from a commentator uh, when it really does require you and I to dig so deep into the scriptures that uh, we can get our help from uh, the context of the words, but uh, I think in um, your fresh eyes on famous Bible sayings, you give me a pretty good Greek uh, lesson in a particular word that I had never heard, and you actually approach it from getting everybody to say it. I can see you in the pulpit. Uh, I actually taught my congregation, uh, we were talking about a false doctrine, and I said, let me teach you a Hebrew word, and I would say, say, ba. And they would say ba, and I'd say say lo, and they would say lo, and then I'd say say ni, and they'd say ni. And I'd say, now put it all together, and they would go baloney. I said, right, that's exactly what that theology is, baloney. So I can see you with this one word. Uh, I, 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 I can't even pronounce it. It's spud. Not so. I, I try to say it like an Italian. Right. Spook so. <laughs> right. So uh, as I was reading that, I was laughing because I remember doing the exact same thing with baloney. Yeah. Uh, but it's not a Hebrew word, of course. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, a meat. Uh, but seeing you, it actually took me to seeing you and a part of your personality, which allowed me to glimpse at somebody that kind of shared the same view with me that scripture is incredibly important. Uh, it's vital, it's, it's like an IV uh, blood transfusion. Uh, you can't survive without the blood. But my goodness, we have made it so heavy. We have made it so serious. We have taken the joy out of it where it's become mundane and so weighty that when I was reading that part of the book, I started to laugh. Uh, because I could see you walking them through the pronunciation and laughing with them while you were doing this. So it kind of endeared me to you as a fellow <laughs> minister that says, you know what, important, but does not have to be so serious. So when you developed as, in your ministry, um, you've, you've written a lot of books. Uh, what, was, what was it prompted you? to start communicating through writing uh, to augment, to supplement, and to engage. Was there something you saw that was lacking in the body that needed to be addressed and you saw the need to address it? Yeah, I think I saw the need primarily as response to my speaking ministry. As the years went on, 
not only within my own congregation and the way that they would respond, not to gimmicks, although I would do some strange things every once in a while just to, because the, the prophetic role is to speak words, but also to demonstrate many times. I mean, the Old Testament prophets demonstrated the message. And so like one particular Sunday, that was Easter Sunday, I wanted to help my people understand when Paul talked about, you know, if Christ has not been raised, then we of all people are to be pitied. Uh, and, and I wanted to have the whole service just emphasize that one thing. So I built a great big wall with a glass window in the middle of it. And as we began the service, you have the typical structure of the service. And as I began the service, we sang that first hymn, and, you know, Christ the Lord is risen today. And after we finished, I just said to the people, you know, that's a wonderful hymn. But if Christ has not been raised, then we might as well take this hymnal and chuck it out the window. And as I did that, I threw it through the glass window and busted the window. And then every other part of the service, um, we did the same thing. So even when we came to the offering, I said, you know, if Christ has not been raised, you people have been just given some money for for no good reason, we might as well just take this offering and chuck it out the window. And I threw that, you know, people were wondering, is he really going to do it? But I would preach like that. I would have a message. Uh, my, my life verse is, uh, at least for pastoral ministry, is Isaiah 50, verse 4. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by, by morning, wakens me like one being taught. And so I, I believed from the very beginning of my pastoral ministry that I needed a fresh word for the people every Sunday. I made a vow that I would never preach the same sermon twice. I'd always go fresh to the Lord every Sunday, saying just like what you said a few minutes ago, recognizing that that congregation, those people with me in that role as their pastor, it wasn't to be a refried sermon that just could be preached anywhere at any time. So because of that, people would respond. And people would say to me, I've never heard things that way before, or the way that you brought that out. And it, it, it over the years, that came to be the most common reaction. And then when I began to be editor of the denominational magazine that I'm in and would travel the country, I would get those same kind of responses. And that led then to what really was the case, was the Lord gave a green light. I, I never, I always wanted to write but I, I don't ever believe that just because we have a passion for something, we're automatically supposed to do it. We still have to wait for the Lord's permission. And so, you know, over the last 10 years, the Lord has given me a green light to start investing uh, quite a bit of my time in the writing ministry, which is basically to do in writing what I've done all these years from the public speaking, the pulpit ministry. You know, it's interesting. I had not ever heard of the Free Methodist Church, so I just Googled it and uh, delighted to see that it's evangelical. Oh, yeah. Uh, delighted to see that the entirety of God is embraced, that it's not the two thirds that yes. seems to be. Uh, we love the Father, we love the Son, but that Holy Spirit, man, that just freaks me out. And uh, yeah. if, if, I, if I get involved with that, am I going to be barking at the moon? and uh, <laughs> jump in the pews, but it seems that this denomination of, of uh, Free Methodist uh, is, as, as much I am, a Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled Jew, yeah. uh, that the fullness of God is fully embraced in this, and uh, I'm delighted. I happen to be the Old Testament scholar in residence, uh, left over from three pastors ago, but nobody ever booted me out at a uh, uh, United Methodist Church. And he was a spirit-filled, uh, he sits on my board, he's my best friend now, uh, gave us a place when I started a congregation, I used his church, we outgrew the church, built our own, and, and just kept on growing from there. But uh, uh, he came to a service one night where I was <clears throat> Kermit the Frog, sitting in the throne, you remember wearing the red smoking jacket and with his legs crossed and there's a big picture of Kermit the Frog and I'm having an argument with Kermit the Frog and <laughs> in the background you hear it's not easy being green and my message was it is be easy being green. 
it is easy to respond with envy and jealousy and anger to any yes. situation. It takes no filter whatsoever. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's not easy. No, yes, it is, Kermit. It's easy to be green. It's our go-to response in situations, and it's not yeah. filtered. It's not seasoned with salt and with light. It's not the, the response of the believer. And at the end of the service, I kept my phone by a microphone, and I have a friend that's a voice artist who, who does the Kermit the Fog voice. And so my phone at the end of the sermon rings, and I have a uh, ringtone that says, Hallelujah, you have a message from God. It's very musical. It's like from the heavens opening up. It's hilarious. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and I believe that every call is a message from God, so I actually use it. And I press answer, and you hear Kermit's voice saying, you know, Rabbi, I listened to your argument, and you're right. It is easy being green. And people just went nuts over it, but they got the message that this, yeah, right. that, you know, so wacky, crazy, uh, doing things that are going to get people to think and get them engaged. Right. <clears throat> And you actually did that with your books. Uh, when they first contacted me, David Cook contacted me about this series, uh, the Fresh Eyes series. I was thinking, all right, um, I've seen a whole lot of Fresh Eyes, and they take the Holy Spirit out. And then I get this other one where uh, any believer is now Jewish. Uh, all you have to do is accept Christ, and you can be a Jew. And all this other fresh eyes, fresh eyes, fresh eyes. And I'm thinking, you know, I come from the world of, of uh, everything has to be in the context of the time. Uh, the message was for the king, uh, for the generation of the king, for today's generation, and for something to come. What was and what is and what is to come. And it begins in Genesis in a subtlety that, that God walked with Adam uh, all the way to the very subtle statement that Enoch walked with God. Well, they're reversed. Hmm. That has hmm. incredible depth and meaning. It's, oh, it, one, one, yeah. one speaks to the righteousness of Enoch, Enoch one speaks to the unrighteousness of Adam. Yeah. And then you see Noah walk with God. And you're saying, okay, I have two righteous examples, and it's framed in a word structure that says God walked with, Abra with, with, uh, with, with Adam and, and Enoch walked with God. Well, that's so subtle. Who would pay any attention to that? Well, I'll pay attention to that right. because right. that's what you and I are called to do is to pay attention to it. Right. So um, when, I, when I looked at this and, and I said, yes, yeah, send it to me. I'm not going to confer. A lot of times I'll see a pitch and I'll say, send them to me and let's book them. Uh, this looks spot on, and when I get the book, it usually is. I'm, I'm pretty good at, at discerning. But in your case, I said, I want the series. I don't want just one. Yeah. I, want, I want the series because I want to see if he's true to the Word of God through fresh eyes on famous Bible sayings, fresh eyes on Jesus' parables, fresh eyes on Jesus' miracles. And did you do what most do and remove the first century Jewish context from the understanding of what was happening at the time. And uh, I have to compliment you. You actually captured nuances that others have missed, and they are fresh eyes. And I appreciate the fact that you took the time because this repeating seminary, seminary teachings, and the root of all this is that People will rest on the statement in Scripture that, that you should endeavor to be as good as your teacher. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, if I'm going to be as good as my teacher, then I'm going to teach what my teacher taught. Yeah, right, right. Okay? I'm not going to try to be better. I'm not going to try to go deeper. Um, scripture admonishes me to endeavor to be as good as your teacher. So if they told me in, in uh, seminary that uh, uh, you only need one semester of Hebrew, but you need two years of Greek, then I'm going to throw out the, the depth of idiomatic understanding, not only of the Old Testament, but I'm also going to lose all the idiom idiomatic understanding of the New Testament because it's sure. Jewish writers. Right, just, right. Just because the medium is Greek doesn't mean the thought isn't Hebrew. 
That's right, right. And uh, unfortunately, you and I are in the small minority of people that in the ministry that look at this and say, hold on a second, we've got to go back to an unfiltered view. Yeah. We, we can't read the Bible with a 21st century mind. Right. And you've captured that in these books. Uh, before we go to break, I want to ask you, what, what was it that made you want to share this Fresh Eyes series of discovery? And it is a discovery. Well, the, the, really, the, uh, when David C. Cook came to me and said, we want you to do this series, I made it. I said to them, I'm glad to share some of these insights that I've received, but my mission is to identify the techniques that I use so that I can actually transfer to other people how they can do the same thing. And so really my mission is to help people go to scripture with fresh eyes themselves. And a lot of times people kind of do it intuitively, but they don't know what they're doing. Uh, and so by identifying the techniques that I use in each of these chapters, so I've got 31 different techniques, and I'm really wanting to transfer this way of thinking that you're talking about and the, and, and the how-tos of going to scripture and seeing something fresh, believing in the Holy Spirit's work in the process. But to give these techniques because, well, you got to go to break, but I'd like to maybe go a little bit more detail about that concept when we get back. Excellent. That'll be a great segue into our opening remarks when we come back from this short break. We'll be right back. Back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Igniting a Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live, four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day, you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. 
We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5th, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Doug Newton, author of the Fresh Eyes series, Discovering New Insights and Familiar Passages, uh, Fresh Eyes on Jesus' Miracles, Fresh Eyes on Jesus' Parables, and Fresh Eyes on Famous Bible Sayings. Uh, Doug Newton, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. This is a pleasure. Thank you. Doug, when we were uh, going to break, we were talking about the techniques that you used in the development of this series, and uh, we left off with you kind of leaving us on a cliffhanger of saying, but wait, there's more. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think part of what um, my ministry is through these books is um, not, I, partly I have to kind of create an apologetic for the whole idea of the human role in the process of inspiration and insight into scripture. Um, I, I'm, I, I believe strongly in the fact that the foundational understanding of God's work in the world is that he works through his word. That's what Genesis 1 says, that everything, and it's not just, his word is not just information. It's not just informative, it's performative. It causes things to happen. And so Genesis 1 is the declaration of this God who causes things to happen, who brings things into being, who transforms things by the power of his word. And that creative and sustaining function has not ended. And so uh, when we think about how the word functions, as we trace it through scripture, we see that there's a strong theme and reality, a dynamic uh, of human partnership in that process of God bringing his will about here on earth. And I see particularly in the role of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in that actual process of the word being made flesh. There you have a human element, the egg, and then the Holy Spirit, and that's, this is the mystery, but the Holy Spirit performing spiritual power on that physical element and the and and the and the word of god is made flesh in that mysterious operation and i don't think that that was just it was a historical moment but i think it was also a template or a pattern of how things work that we bring something to the lord that we have to offer it's incomplete and can't even produce life, but we bring that to the Lord and the Holy Spirit works upon what we offer him, our mind, our attention, the, the, uh, the techniques that our mind can function in, and, and he works upon that by his spirit and the word of God is made faith. In other words, yes, we see it in flesh incarnate, incarnated in Jesus, but now that word becomes part of us 
and it becomes part of creating faith in us to then function in the name of Jesus and to grow in Christ likeness. So having said all of that, the question then is, what's the human part in this process? And I think that obviously it's study and 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 uh, the careful kind of diligent working with the Word of God, the careful attention, which has be, which has been crucial to seeing into Scripture the things that God wants to reveal. But I also recognize that that the role of the human being has to do with imagination as well. Now the imagination issue is sometimes held in suspicion, and I think it should be, but there's a difference between vain imagination and holy imagination. I think the mind can actually um, extrapolate, it can correlate, it can do these, these creative things that with with the raw material of the Word of God that the Holy Spirit then can illumine and bring inspiration in. And and sometimes people will say to me, but I don't, I don't have a real good imagination. And, and I say back to people, well, can you worry? And everybody says, well, yeah, I worry. Well, worry is the imagination at work. It's just imagining scenarios that might happen that scare you or make you concerned. But the imagination can also go to Scripture and imagine the actual situation. It can imagine being there in that moment when Jesus turned the water into wine. It can, it can help you think about how the, the parable of the Good Samaritan could, could extrapolate beyond just that one moment and ask the question, well, what if the Good Samaritan came across another victim the next day? And what if he came across another victim another time? His strategy for rescue would probably have to change because he couldn't handle all of that on his own. Now, when you use your imagination like that, you you obviously draw a, a solid line between what Scripture actually says and what you're imagining, and you're not turning your imaginations into Scripture, into the Word of God, but in that work of imagining, which is just another word for meditating on the Word, the Holy Spirit helps us see things and have thoughts that we might not have had if we didn't let our minds function in those ways. And so in these books, that's a long answer, but my passion is to identify some of these creative things that your mind can do that helps to to uh, see these new things in Scripture. And obviously, again, check them against the Word. You don't go flying off the handle and right. making things up, but it just opens up so many ways in which the Holy Spirit can then work on your mind to have insights that you wouldn't have if you just go lockstep with, with just the words themselves. You know, what's fascinating about you picking Mary and... Uh, that, that picture of the activation of the seed by the Holy Spirit. It is the fulfillment of the oldest prophecy in the Bible, Genesis 3.15. Right. The seed of the woman. Now, right. when we, in modern day science, we now understand the genetic composition of a seed. Uh, and uh, in my book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life, in my chapter on the seed, we actually talk about a seed, the Methuselah seed, which lay dormant for 2,000 years in Qumran, that were found inside one of the Dead Sea Scroll containers, and there were three palm kernels. And they planted those three palm kernels, sealed for 2,000 years, and one grew and bore fruit. So we knew then about the physical dormancy of a seed, which had already been, uh, in order for a seed to be a seed, it has to be um, fertilized, okay? Mm. Uh, so right. Right. It, it only needs activation. And no. in the case of a physical seed, the activation is light, water, and a medium to grow in, okay? Right. The activation of this seed, Genesis 3.15, seed of the woman, lays dormant within women, the lineage, and this is why 
God gave us the lineage of Miriam, of Mary. It's the only woman in the Bible whose genealogy is given. Why? Mm. Because we can see how the seed traveled through right. the promises of God and then was activated by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So this immaculate conception, these theologies, I don't need doctrine or I don't need the commentator to tell me. I just need to go back to the facts of when I'm introduced to the seed and then backwards from the genealogy of Mary, trace the lineage of the seed back to the promise that was made and say, aha, okay, right. now I understand all right, that this was the promised seed of the woman, confirmed all the way through the prophets and the scriptures. And so right. when we put fresh eyes on this and we connect the dots, and this is what you've done so beautifully in your books, is you give us a, um, you call it a vision check. Uh, how to have 2020 vision. Each chapter includes a 2020 vision, uh, but you also have this concept uh, at the end of the chapter called a vision check. So uh, you really do take it to, and, and I, I like things that are thematic and I can connect it with my glasses and with my um, cataract implants and uh, things that altered my vision over the years. And how do I, how do I go, why do I go each year to make sure that I maintain 2020 vision? Because I have to have a vision check. And yeah. you use it as a tool in the book. Walk us through some of the methodology and then we'll get into maybe one or two of the fresh eyes statements. Sure. I uh, in the book itself, I wasn't able to kind of kind of categorize all of these techniques. That's going to be something that will be on the phone app uh, that's associated with the books and on the website. But uh, I've got 31 techniques, and they fall into three categories. Uh, the, the, one of the categories is what I call magnifying glass, which is kind of our, our uh, common understanding of Bible study, where you look very closely at the text and you use cross-referencing and word studies and all of the things that relate to the text and the context uh, directly. But then I do have another category called corrective lenses, where, uh, where we have to recognize that over time, Many times what winds up happening is our understanding of a particular text um, gets truncated or it gets uh, turned into kind of a cliche. Uh, and maybe even things are passed along uh, from, like you were saying earlier, teacher to student to student to teacher to student. To st and they're actually passing along something that uh, turns out to not be what the scripture text was really talking about at all. And so there are techniques that you can use that kind of can undo. I talk about an etch-a-sketch, you know, where you have to sometimes take your mind and turn it upside down and shake it right. in order to erase all of the imprinting that you've had. Again, not that, I mean, most of the teaching that we've received in the, in, in the body of Christ and so forth is good, sound stuff. But every once in a while, Things get passed along, and especially because we this have this tendency to sometimes go to Scripture like it's a problem to be solved. And once you figure out this passage, well, I've, and you, you put a check mark by it, I know what that one means, and you move on. And you never go back to that passage and say, well, maybe I should try looking at it from a different angle. And so uh, some of these techniques are, are what I call corrective lenses, uh, where you, techniques are, are corrective like that. And then, then the third category is what I call virtual reality goggles. Um, you know, virtual reality isn't just for gamers today. It's right. what airline pilots use to learn how to handle emergency situations. It's how architects can actually walk through a building they're going to build before uh, even uh, the foundation is laid. It's how scientists and engineers can actually construct something and they can Surgeons can practice a surgical technique, and they do it in a virtual realm. And some of these techniques have to do with, with helping us create a, a, a virtual reality around the biblical story. For example, the unmerciful servant parable. One of the things scripture often does is it jumps across 
gaps in time and it doesn't fill you in on what happened in that gap. Right. And so here's this unmerciful servant who uh, was re received this unbelievable e expression of forgiveness of a debt that could never be paid. And then the next scene jumps immediately to him choking someone who owes him a buck twenty five. But and the way that and the way the parable just jumps to that. It, it, it's, I mean, it's not that Jesus taught it wrong. He was making his point. But I think there's a reason for us to kind of go into those gaps and ask the question, how could it possibly have been the case that this servant who had been forgiven so much could have turned around? He, he must have felt he was doing something that was okay, that was right. What was the rationalization he might have used? And so... That's what that's an example of, of a virtual reality technique that I call fill the gaps. Right. Where, where you when, when you see a gap like that in in the text, you just go ahead and you imagine particularly yourself in that situation. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit convicted me of two or three different ways that I rationalize unforgiveness that I would never have seen if I hadn't have kind of taking this virtual reality, you know, foray into that gap. The, the Bible doesn't say what happened in that gap, but by doing that, the Holy Spirit used it as a moment of conviction for me. And isn't that what we're supposed to do? Um, one of my favorite, and, and I, I, I have a software product that has 120 translations of the Bible in uh, Greek, in Hebrew, in uh, interlinear, all that, and then on my library shelf, uh, from the ESV to the TLV to the MIC, KEY, MOUSE, I've got them all. Um, yeah. But the one that um, fascinated me was uh, early on in my walk with the Lord was a life application Bible. Mm, yes. Because it was one thing that I knew what I knew about the Old Testament, and I knew what the rabbis told me. Uh, but the life application Bibles are written by not Hebrew scholars, but they're written by uh, Christians. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's who's actually on the panel of these, yeah. of these, of the King James and the New King James. And, you know, they're not really uh, filled with a bunch of Hebrew scholars trying to give you idiomatic insight into why words are phrased, like understanding that the concept of, of Jesus and the blind man at the Pool of Salaam, that he was blind from birth. It's illogical. Yeah. Uh, we don't give visual acuity tests to babies, newborn babies. Yeah. You know, point, point to the X, point to the O. Yeah. Uh, we don't know if a baby can see. The yeah. only way we know if they're blind from birth is if they have no eyes. Mm -hmm. And so it was an idiom yes. in the right. time for born without eyes. Yes. So you go to the parents for verification. Was this kid really born without eyes? Yeah. Then Jesus reaches down. He says, I only do what I see, saw my father do. So he reaches in the dirt and he creates a pair of eyes for this man, which is the only way he can see. Well, we, uh, it's truly lost in the translation because there's a Hebrew word called bara, which is an attribute of God. Only God can create. So when yeah. he does this, he is demonstrating that he is God in the flesh. Well, yeah. you, you don't right. find that anywhere. So yeah. uh, uh, I'm looking at, at okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a new believer. And so, okay, this is great. You know, this is wonderful. Okay, uh, how often shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? No, 70 times 70. And so you read the life application. Uh, it's for the same thing. And he never apologizes. And uh, that's... 400, it's 490 times and everything's in a concept of a day. Yeah. So I got to forgive him 490 times in a day in my waking hours, yeah. which is only 16. I'm now into, uh, what, 30 times an hour every two minutes. I got to forgive this guy for the same thing. I might as well just walk in forgiveness. Yeah. That's the... See, it's the and what you're doing is is what you're doing is what a lot of people is what I'm saying to people is so simple. If you would pause long enough, do exactly what you just did there. It's kind of calculate that out, you know, see what that really means. And all of a sudden the message goes way beyond how many times. And just like you said, that was so good. It becomes a spirit of forgiveness. Right. 
Yeah, 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 fantastic. Well, yeah. I thought about, okay, you're supposed to turn the other cheek. Okay, if I have to turn the other cheek every two minutes, I'm, I, I might as well get myself something where I can spin around because yeah. I'm going to be as dizzy, and I'm a person that doesn't do um, amusement park rides. I have very sensitive balance. Uh, I pastored five cruises, and I promise you that I was green uh, <laughs> on every one of those cruises that you would have think you were seeing The Exorcist. Uh, I was so seasick. There was nothing they could do for me. I got the shots. I got the patch. I got the wristband. I took the drama. I mean, I took it all. I'm just not meant for a constant motion. And so as I'm reading scripture and going, I got to be the spinning man. Uh, in, in order to walk out this walk. So you know what? Um, taking offense is, that's an action on my part. Yeah, right. I, I have to literally take the offense. Yeah. And, and the message is so simple and so clear. So what you've done uh, with, with these books is take us to that kind of, of fresh eyes on these kind of, of uh of stories. So I'll ask you, uh, you did famous Bible sayings, Jesus parables, and Jesus miracles. Which one was the most fun for you? Uh, and the one that when you began to apply your own 2020 uh, vision statements were aha moments even after 35 years of, of adopting this kind of preaching style and study style, which ones were like, oh, I don't think I ever saw that before. Yeah, that's an interesting question because when I got the assignment uh, from David C. Cook, I probably only had material from sermons for, for maybe half. And so I, in five months, they wanted three books. And uh, so I was in kind of an intensive where I was just depending on the Lord, show me new stuff in new places. And so here's one here. So I, I can't pick a favorite, but here's one that comes to my mind right now that was just a simple little thing that had had never I had never seen before. And uh, one of the techniques that I, I, I talk about, and it's a simple one that helps people see things they've never seen before is and it's not a, again, it's it's no big deal, uh, but people just don't take the time to do it. And that is get rid of the chapter and verse markers in a portion of scripture that you're going to read. Get rid of those and start reading it narratively. Okay, so I did that when it came to the story of the storm at sea, and it, it's in Mark 4, mm -hmm. and it moves from, from the storm at sea. Now, I had seen this before. It moves from the storm at sea to the deliverance of the demoniac. And I had right. seen those two things combined before because there's, it's such a clear example of satanic interference as the gospel was being brought for the first time into a new geographical re region, a stronghold of the enemy. And so it was this huge interference. And I even tell stories in the book about how I learned that lesson in, in the pastoral role ministering to some people. But here's what I had never seen before. It, because I, I, had, I made the mistake myself. I saw, I, I, I had removed the chapter marker and the verse markers between Mark 4 and Mark 5. But as soon as the story of the deliverance of the demoniac was over and Jesus left that moment, I stopped there as if there was a gap and never noticed the next verse which says that Jesus just basically went back across the lake. And I had always thought that he was entering into a new geographical territory to stay there. But the fact that all he did was go across the lake, had that encounter, mm -hmm. and then turned right around and went back, all of a sudden opened up for me that there was something about God's strategy there that was much more intentional than what I had seen before, rather than seeing it as he goes across the lake to open up the gospel in a new area, and uh-oh, look what we encounter. You know, we're encountering this demoniac. All of a sudden, I'm realizing what, before he even went across the lake, there was a, a plan he had, and that was to go have this encounter 
set this guy free. And probably from a kingdom perspective, there was a strategy behind that. Right. But right. just to return home. And what that said to me and what the Holy Spirit began to open up for me is that shows God's intentionality to, to address in any one of our lives some territory, some area. And he loves us so much that he'll just go at that territory to do that work of freedom and then come back. In other words, the whole goal was freedom. The whole goal was freedom. And then, it, for me, that tied to Jesus, his inaugural address about, about uh, you know, the Jubilee year, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And every single one of the things that he did was actually setting people free. It was it was the story of liberation that that was he was talking about the freedom that he was going to bring from the power of the enemy. Even uh, opening the eyes of the blind wasn't about their physical eyes. It was about leading them. You know, the passage in Isaiah it's about leading people out of a dungeon that's completely dark, and by bringing them up into freedom, they now can see. They're up into the light. So, so I did. It just raised for me. Uh, to a higher level of importance and significance and intentionality that God is in a mission to set people free from whatever territory inside their life still needs freedom. There's, there's no question. You know, on the Hebrew scrolls, we have no chapters and verses. Um, as a young boy, I had to open the scroll and find the key word I was looking for that was the beginning of the passage that yeah. I was trying to read. All yeah. of the scrolls combined, if we were to take them one large scroll, there would not be a, a, a space, a blank, a number, a chapter, a verse. And uh, I've always said that 2 Corinthians 5.17 through 6.10 is one consistent thought and one expression uh, yeah. that uh, of, of, uh, and should not have been broken up because it is the whole picture right. of the new creation. That's uh, right. And it's a, it's a it's a um, it's it's grabbing the thought that is right. captured. But if you stop in your reading and then you go on to chapter six and start with six one, you have to go back and read. Yeah. Uh, 2 Corinthians five seventeen because it makes no it's it's like a dangling prize just hangs out there. Yeah, that's uh, and, right. and it's confusing to us. Uh, Doug, unfortunately, we have run out of time, but it has been a sheer pleasure to uh, meet you and a blessing to find a like-minded brother in the Lord that yes. believes that uh, we're not finished and none of us have arrived and that those who are out there that are hungry for the Lord and hungry for fresh eyes and hungry to understand uh, this new series uh which uh, has a release date in, in just a couple of days, uh, but is available. August first. August, August first, but it's actually available to order. Yeah. Uh, it's Doug Newton, Fresh Eyes. It's the Fresh Eyes series. Fresh Eyes on famous, famous Bible sayings. Fresh Eyes on Jesus' parable. Fresh Eyes on Jesus' miracles, and you will get fresh eyes. Your eyes will be open to a new way to look at Scripture. And if you were to master the techniques in here, you can take any part of the Bible, any part, any chapter or verse, any part, any segment in any book of the Bible and begin to understand with fresh eyes how to process. These techniques are valuable, important, and available to you. Doug Newton, thank you so much for sharing this with us here on Revealing the Truth. Thank you and bless you. Bless your ministry. Thank you so much. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.